Welcome back to another exciting episode of Aaron's Opinion, the podcast for blind people where we talk about critical issues in the blindness community. I'm Aaron Richmond. Tonight's episode, like all others, is of course copywritten by me, Aaron Richmond, and Aaron's Opinion. Thank you. You can, of course, watch this episode right here on YouTube, where so many of you do, along with iTunes and really anywhere else you get a podcast. Don't forget, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and even consider becoming a patron on my Patreon page. Or you could even comment below on this video, Aaron's Opinion 6 at gmail.com. For all those nasty and nice text messages, 1240-681-9869. That's not my real number, so it's not that exciting. Uh, anyway, let's, um, to all you superhero fans out there, let's get into this. Um, we are joined this evening by the author of American Madness. T joins us. Now, I, I have to be, as a, as a content creator and as a podcaster and as a teacher myself, by the way, T, the truth of the matter is I have not read your book. Um, it's extremely fascinating. Um, the other thing is I, I have only known about this story. There you are. I've only known about this story simply because I listened to Deep Cuts. And if I had never listened to that podcast, I never would have known about this. How do I even begin? This character by the name of Richard McLean. Um, my first question to you is, of course, so as an author, um, have you always had a, did you, did you always enjoy writing about, you know, superheroes and this whole, what do I even call it? This whole like culture, this whole uh, fixation, I guess. H have you always written about this topic before? That would be my first question. Well, I think um, a good place to start is uh, when I was a kid, I used to love to read superhero comics. Um, that right. was probably one of the first things I was able to read on my own you know, and uh, being able to kind of sound out the words and see them matched with images was uh, really helpful in, in learning how to read. Uh, and, and I love those characters, you know, and I have throughout my life. So uh, what happened was one day in 2009, actually, um, I read this short news blurb and it just said that, hey, there's this growing movement of people who actually adopt their own superhero personas and some of them actually try to go out and fight crime and stuff like that and i was like wait a minute what's what does this what does this mean what are they talking about um and they said that the name of this sort of subculture were they called themselves real life superheroes or rlsh and that there were at least a couple of hundred of them all over the country who were going on patrols and uh, doing charity events and stuff like that. Um, so at that time, I was doing a lot of freelance writing for local magazines and newspapers. And I was like, if there's one of these real life superhero guys here in my hometown, I want to meet him because uh, I'm going to write an article about him. And I'm just really curious, like, is this, are these people for real or what? So I did a Google search and I found that here in my home city of uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, we did have a real life superhero and his name was the Watchman. So um, he had, he actually had a MySpace page. This is when MySpace was still around. And I sent him a message and I said, hey, I'm, I'm really curious about this. I, I'd love to meet you. So we set up a meeting late one night at a city park and I was just kind of walking around there in the dark by myself. And all of a sudden I see this guy wearing a full on superhero costume walking right towards me. And I was like, wow, there he is. This guy is for real. And we had a really long talk that night and it was really interesting. And I, I really liked him actually, I thought, a lot of the stuff he said made sense, and I became very curious about the whole real-life superhero movement. So um, I decided I wanted to write a book about it, and I worked on it slowly over a couple of years. Um, I would take a couple of days off and go out to New York or to San Diego and meet some of the superheroes and go on patrol with them. 
And eventually that all became my first book, Heroes in the Night, which was published in 2013. Excellent. Okay. Well, that is, um, there, there's some, there's something very both entertaining on one hand about that, about this whole notion of these real life superheroes, but then there's also something that's a little off-putting about it. I can't quite place it. Something is a little, is a little, that that's a little unusual. Um, yeah. that's a little like, yeah, that that's really that, there's something about it I can't quite place it, but that is there's something unusual about that. Well, so yeah. then now by the way, I'm I'm 29 years old. Um so, you know, I'm you know, I'm much I'm I'm you know much younger. Um so then how did you come across this whole uh phantom patriot guy as you say as I heard, you know, educating myself as much as I could about the topic, which of course, because I had never heard of any of this is all, this is all, this is news to me. How did you find out about this guy in the 1980s, this Richard guy who basically started out the same? And then, you know, if you want, you can get into how it definitely got out of control, but yeah. yeah. Sure. So um, before my book was done, one thing that I did, uh, which I thought was a smart move was I started a blog, which was also called Heroes in the Night. And um, I would blog about different real life superheroes I had met, or if anything newsworthy happened, I'd write a short little bit about that. Um, and that was a really good first step towards the book because uh, I started to get some good traffic to my blog. Um, a lot of the real life superheroes themselves were sharing links to my blog. And occasionally uh, a bigger uh, news media outlet would reference my blog and link to it so i started to get some good traffic on that and um so one day in 2010 um i got an email from a guy named richard mccasling and he said hey t i i read about this book that you're working on and i just wanted you to know um that i actually was a, a real life superhero way back in the day and uh, the most famous thing about me was that in 2002, I raided this place called the Bohemian Grove, and I set it on fire while I was dressed as my superhero persona, the Phantom Patriot. And if you want to interview me, I'm, you know, <laughs> I'd love to talk to you. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, whoa, wait, you know, yeah, at the yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, and if I if I had been reading that, on one hand, there's kind of some, it's kind of some red flags. Yes. Yeah. Like, not, by, by the way, by the way, not totally. I, compl I, I commend, I applaud you for the book and interviewing him. But, you know, it's, it's kind of a strange thing to say, hey, I'm a superhero. By the way, I raided a kind of a secret organization and started a yeah. fire. But still, but still, can, can, can we talk, please? Like, you know, that's kind of, <laughs> right, right. I, I would have been I would have been like, OK, well, that's that's a red flag. I, in my mind, I would think, well, that's a red flag for me. But I, I would still want to talk to them. So then you kept talking to him. And then and then what happened? Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, it was a red flag. And I was like, I had met some kind of out there characters already working on Heroes in the Night, you know, I'd gone on patrol with some of these guys. But I had never heard of this place, the Bohemian Grove that he was talking about. And, and so I was like, what is this guy talking about? So I started reading about the Bohemian Grove, which is um, this, it's sort of a secret club for very wealthy and powerful men. It's in the northern uh, Redwood Forest of California. It does exist. It does have uh, some very powerful men as a membership. Um, and, you know, it's close to the public. So I started uh, reading about that place. And then I got back to Richard and I said, okay, I'm curious to know more about what this is all about because this place does sound weird. And um, you seem like you've got an interesting story. So he uh, sent me a package that had some um, comics that he had drawn. It was sort of an autobiographical comic that he had drawn about his life. And he sent me a letter um, talking about uh, 
you know, raid that he had done the Bohemian Grove. And I found it to be really fascinating. Mm -hmm. Um, It was a little bit frightening for sure. But I was like, okay, I'm going to keep in touch with this guy and, and see what he has to say. And I ended up then, you know, he first contacted me in 2010 and very slowly over about nine years, um, I slowly pieced together his story um, through correspondence and we ended up meeting each other in person three different times. Um, And he, he, he started to lay out this very fascinating and I would say very sad story. So um, he was very fascinated with comic books starting when he was a child and his parents, his father was pretty abusive towards him. So I think that he escaped into these comic books as a a way to, you know, escape from that reality. Um, And he became like very focused on superhero comic books Uh, after high school he joined the marines because he said that he thought it would be like a superhero training school and um (laughs) he went uh, he went after that he went to stuntman school for a while because he wanted to learn how to do action stunts and um he started to design his own superhero costumes so starting way back in the 80s he actually went on some patrols dressed in costume uh, these superheroes that he had invented, like the Lynx was one of his superhero personas. Um, so, you know, he's kind of going through life. And then in the late 90s, he hits this really rough patch in his life, I would say. Um, his, his parents both died. Uh, he was having a lot of trouble finding direction as far as a, a career or a relationship or even friendships. And he stumbles across a documentary that's made by a conspiracy theorist named Alex Jones. And he becomes very fascinated by this documentary, quote unquote, about the Bohemian Grove, where Alex Jones says that they're doing these satanic rituals in the woods and there's all sorts of terrible stuff going on. So he invents his own persona, the Phantom Patriot, which has this kind of creepy skull mask and a jumpsuit and he gets a bunch of weapons and then he actually drives to California and he raids this place, the Bohemian Grove. And he ends up having a standoff with the police. He came pretty close to dying that day, um, but he surrendered and then he went to jail uh, for about six and a half years. And uh, when he first contacted me in 2010 he was out but he was still on parole (laughs) okay so so did did he when he contacted you did he mention that hi i'm a superhero but i forgot the superpower that gets me off of parole did he mention that (laughs) Yes, you know, I have uh, superpowers like that. Yeah. So I, I thought, I, I thought, I, I didn't know that superpower superheroes ended up on parole. I, I didn't know it worked <laughs> like that. Well, yep. um, uh, well, of course, I, I, I believe you, and I, you know, yes, obviously that's true, um, mm-hmm. and obviously I believe everything from the deep cuts episode about all of this, all of this uh, interesting stuff. But so. D- did you go back and like you know piece together his story and like fact check it all? I mean, you know, as I said, I'm I'm only 29. I don't I don't remember this. Ha- I don't necessarily remember this raid thing in California. I mean, did you go back and make sure that it all happened? O- only reason I ask is, yeah, the entire the entire story is so unsettling unsettling and strange that it makes me wonder like how much of this is true and then how much of this is his obsession with all of these things put together that's that that's what i'm asking what do you what's your perception of that yes i actually i put a lot of work into fact checking this story um so one thing that i discovered uh when i was done is that richard uh was not a liar um i think a lot of times he would tell a story and it would be told through his own filter um and he had this sort of a conspiracy filter where he would see these details that weren't there but um the basic parts of his story are true 
So uh, some of the references I used were at the time that this happened in 2002, the story did not catch on like he hoped it would. He was hoping that it would get a lot of media attention and it would be in USA Today and they'd be talking about it on the news and everything. But this was a little bit before uh, the era where things sort of went viral, I think. However, there were quite a few news reports about this in the Sonoma County Press Democrat, which is the local newspaper to where the Bohemia Grove is, Sonoma County. And the San Francisco Chronicle also wrote a couple of articles about him. But the real deep dive information I got was um, from two sources. One, I filed the Freedom of Information Act request with the United States uh, Secret Service because he had said that they had interviewed him. So I knew if they had interviewed him uh, after he got arrested, then they would have a file on him. And sure enough, it took about three years for them to finally process that and send it to me. Uh, but I eventually got their 176 page file on Richard McCassa. Uh, the other big thing that I got was a full transcript of his uh, court appearance, uh, which was in 2003. So it was about a five volume set and it was the entire two week long trial completely transcribed. So, um, you know, that's where I got a lot of information and where I got the perspective of things like the responding officers who confronted him at the Bohemian Grove, um, as well as a couple of the witnesses who were there who had seen him. Um, and also, you know, some of their investigative work, talking to some of his friends and stuff of that, like that. Um, I also did interview quite a few of his friends um, and other people that he had crossed paths with. So using all of those sources, I finally was able to put together the story that I thought was an accurate portrayal and not just Richard's version of the story. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. So what, what did his other friends say about him would be, would be the question. Um, a lot of them, I talked to someone who was in the Marines with him and he, he didn't have a lot to say about it, but uh, he has he had this friend named Lon who uh, had gone to stuntman school with him in the 80s. And Lon is a, a really great guy. And he's pretty much the only consistent friend that Richard had for most of his life. Um, they met and became friends at stunt school. And then uh, something that really touched me, I guess, was Lon had met Richard's parents shortly before they died. And one of the things that Richard's mom said to Lon was, you know, I'm really concerned about Richard because I don't think that he has any friends and I'm worried about him. So I think Ron, uh, uh, Lon, I'm sorry, uh, after that uh, kind of felt like he was someone that needed to be Richard's friend, like no matter what. And he certainly doesn't agree with Richard's beliefs or or the things that he did but he always kind of stuck with him and, and and helped him out where he could so um so it was really interesting to get his perspective the perspective of someone who viewed richard not as a complete crazy guy but uh someone who was a human and and had had some problems in his life but he also had a good side you know he could be a, a really nice person uh i think that he did try to help people out when he raided the Bohemian Grove, it's because he believed this conspiracy that there were people that were in prison there and that they were going to be sacrificed in this satanic ritual. So he thought that he was going to be helping people when he raided this place. But of course, he was just very misguided on that. Yeah, no, I mean, in my, my perspective of um, having number one, having never known about any of this until I listened to the episode and having never read the book about it, just from the complete outsider perspective, just as another podcaster looking into this, he, to me, he seems like a really nice guy, but he also seems like some nice guy, but a lot of challenges in his life. He seems yeah. he he's, he's good. He, he has, he has a good soul, 
but he seems to me like he's simply misled and kind mm. of just kind of a nice guy, but not quite. Yeah, just simply misled. And then I think if I understood it correctly, he had some sort of a, as I would describe it, some sort of a little fixation with some country music star. And he kind of went Hinkley. He almost became like a Hink. He had a Hinkley-ish type of fixation at one point. That was really strange too. What 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 was that about? Yeah. So um, so what happens is I, I think he was sort of having a mental breakdown at this point. Um, his yeah. He, as I mentioned, his parents had died. His parents left him a pretty sizable inheritance, all right? It was uh, about $700,000. So he had a lot of money, um, but he didn't really have any friends. He didn't have any direction in life. And he had this unhealthy fixation on a country music singer named, named Shelley Wright. And he saw that she was having a charity event in Nashville. Um, so he drove up there and, and one of the prizes in this charity event was uh, having a dinner with her, you know, to the highest bidder. So he bid $14,500. Uh, he won and he went on this dinner date and he kind of was delusional and thought that they were falling in love with each other. Uh, when they weren't, you know, she was just being polite to him because he had been the winning bidder on this dinner date. Um, so after that, he was very, uh, once he realized that she didn't like him, he was very heartbroken about it. He tried to write letters to her fan club several times until they told him, you know, you better, you better knock this off. Okay. You're not, you're not getting the hint that she's not going to have a romance with you. So, I mean, that was kind of like the last uh, piece of the, the puzzle that made him decide that he was going to go full on conspiracy commando and uh, raid this place of Bohemian Grove. So it's just like, I feel bad for him because I, he just like was really struggling to figure out life during this time. And what, what year was this? country music star thing what what year was this incident with uh, the country music star it was in 2001 and and so he did his raid in january 2002 so very shortly after that you know hmm. yeah yeah that's too bad that that would extend that explains why celebrities now don't do fan mail yes. they don't i mean yeah. like tr trust me i i am i am not important i am not famous and and luckily, I don't want to be either one for this very reason. There's all sorts of creepy people or, you know, in, in, in Richard's case, it sounds a lot of this sounds like it's actually not his fault. So we have to be, you know, well, I'm kind, I, I, you know, I'm understanding of it. But other times you get evil people that truly want to hurt you just because they're evil. Richard does not seem he doesn't seem evil. He seems just misled. But he had, yeah, he, he didn't. He had a lot of trouble, like making connection with people, you know, and yeah. uh so this was a, a case of where his parents had never really talked to him about like uh, what romance or a healthy relationship might be like. And so, you know, he had this uh, unfortunate incident that happened with, with the country singer. Yeah. Yeah. That is, that is very, very, un, very dangerous. I'm, I'm sure now that person, that country singer, I'm sure she doesn't do any more charities. I mean, can you imagine in today's world, you win a charity dinner, you can have, you can have a dinner with the person. Like that's obviously, I yeah. mean, it's like, you're like, I, I, I'm not, I'm not trying, I'm not trying to sound obnoxious, but it's like, you're kind of asking in a, in a way you're kind of asking for a problem. Cause I mean, you're, it's like, you're saying to anyone who, Anyone who has enough money to, right. to win the bid is going to be the crazy person. If you're normal, you would know. I, I, guess, I guess if you aren't struggling, you would know not to do that, I guess. But it seems it seems like they should have known not to do that. But I guess not. I guess. I, I don't know. Well, I, I think you're right. I'm pretty sure that was the last time that that she ever did that again. <laughs> but did, did, did you now? Did you ever did you ever interview her about this? I tried. Um, I sent <laughs> I sent an email to her talent agency, um, and they replied with a, a very short but understandable uh, <laughs> statement, which said, 
Shelley Wright does not want to talk uh, to Richard McCaslin or anyone involved. <laughs> regardless, regardless of how much you were going to give her, regardless how good the meal would have been that you would have wanted to spend with her, right? <laughs> she was, she was, she wasn't up for that. Well, I, I completely, I, I understand. Yeah, you got to yeah, be careful. Too. You got to be careful about these things. Yeah, yeah that's, was. that's the weirdest thing. Yeah. Yeah, and I was I tried to be careful in the book, you know, and and she, I I, I hated writing about it because it, it seems like she's a, a really nice person. Um, she's a very uh, generous person. She started this foundation that um, donates uh, musical instruments to low income schools and stuff like that. So I was like, she sounds uh, really nice. I, I hate to drag her name into this, but that's where the story went, you know. Hmm. Hmm. I guess, could you have changed her name? You know, sometimes I've heard that in books they do that. Could you have altered her name in the book or it, you didn't? I didn't. I did not do that because um, there's certain details where it would have been really obvious who it was anyway. So, yeah. And, uh, and the information I use, you know, was stuff that, uh, I, you know, I found in documents and stuff like that. So, hmm. Mm. So now where, what, are, are there still all these superheroes running around today? Have you oh, kept yeah. up with the rest of the, okay, so it's still a growing, uh, what do I even call it? Field, activity, obsession, um, all of the above? I usually refer to it either as a subculture because- There you go, subculture. They have their own like lingo and, and, and media and stuff like that, or sometimes a movement I'll refer to as a, like a social movement, you know? Um, but yeah, I don't think it's a growing movement. Um, but there still are definitely, um, real life superheroes who are active. I, I still stay in touch with some of them because, um, they vary quite a bit, you know, some of them, uh, I will admit are kind of frightening and, uh, delusional. Those are usually the guys who think that they're Batman or something, but some of them have a more mellow kind of cool take on it where they'll do uh, charity events mostly, or they'll do these sort of humanitarian missions where they'll hand out supplies to homeless people. Um, or, you know, they'll use their superhero persona to like draw attention to a cause. Mm -hmm. uh, so not all of them are like, just running around in the dark trying to punch people or something like that right so, right no no that's and that's that's not what i would so i guess my question about all of this or another another interesting facet of it is so if these people having nothing to do with richard for a minute if these people want to be superheroes that's great but can't you be a superhero without dressing up like a superhero i mean seriously if you want to help people couldn't they do that couldn't they just be helpful people without being a superhero what i guess i'm trying to make to connect the dots here what is the connection why do they feel this desire to like wear a certain shirt or to show their superpower why can't they just use their own power i guess yeah and that's a criticism uh that, that's pretty common about them no no yeah. i'm not i'm not no no no. i'm not i'm not criticizing i'm not being critical about it i was just yeah. i was just asking like what's the um, the, like the philosophy behind it, I guess. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, no. And I, I think if it was a criticism, it'd be a fair one. Um, I think th <laughs> that the philosophy behind it is, um, that they, the superhero persona, um, is helpful to them themselves. It makes them feel like a superhero. Uh, it makes them feel cool. It makes them, uh, feel like they can take on the world. And I think that some of them hope that that inspires other people too, you know, to see people, everyday people uh, doing super heroic stuff. So it's kind of a, a philosophy of um, unlocking your inner superhero and dressing sort of to match that. And <clears throat> now let's move more towards more towards today. So, okay, yeah. how is Richard today? Like, what is he doing? Is he is he better today? Is he, I would hope that someone like him is, um, you know, taking care of themselves and getting more, uh, you know, more more stable and more healthy, even though, and they can still be a superhero too, but I, I hope he's taking care of himself. What do you think? Well, um, he became very bogged down with conspiracy theory, obviously. It landed yeah. him in jail. 
And he did not, some people, you know, will have a wake up call and they'll be like, oh, this is a wrong idea that I had. But unfortunately, when he got out of prison, he kept getting deeper and deeper into conspiracy theory. Uh, he did not change his mind about the Bohemian Grove. In fact, he became, he became rather obsessed with conspiracy theory and it was taking a toll on him. Uh, I kept hoping that he would find something that he uh, could do that was sort of lift him up a little bit. He was a very creative person, you know, he made these costumes, he drew comic books. So he had these very creative ideas, but unfortunately uh, in 2018, he decided that he would end his own life. Oh, oh, I'm so, I'm so sorry. Um, I, it, I, I didn't realize that. I'm, I wouldn't have asked that. I'm sorry. I'm, it's okay. It's, yeah, uh, I, I, I wouldn't have asked that question if I had known that was that answer. Oh, that's okay. Uh, and I write, I write about that in my book too. Oh, that's that's all. That's awful. Yes. See that yeah. kind of. Oh God. See, but yeah. that kind of ruins the whole. Well, obviously, it ruins the whole thing. Yeah. Now I feel okay. Now I'm like a hundred percent feeling sorry for him now. I yeah. guess. Yes. Yeah. It's, oh, it's that's terrible. too bad. Oh, that's. Yeah. That's really, that's depressing. That's not even interesting. That's just depressing. That's yes. really weird. But. Yes. And it's something, you know, I tell people, uh, one thing that I wanted to, to get across in this book is some of these conspiracy theory ideas, um, well, some of them I, I think are, are kind of harmless, right? Like I love the X-Files when I was younger and I, and I like hearing about extraterrestrials and stuff like that. Um, so some of that's harmless, but I think some conspiracy theory can be really dangerous yeah. because it gets into someone's head and then it's, it kind of, it doesn't leave and it gets worse and worse and they become more and more paranoid and angry and it does a really bad thing to your brain. So, you know, I think people should certainly be skeptical um, and they should be interested in stuff <clears throat> like that. But some people kind of step over that line of no return and uh, their life is miserable and dark because of this conspiracy theory stuff. Yeah, you know, we see it a lot in, um, I don't I don't name drop on, on my show, but I do listen, I spend an enormous, well, first of all, when I'm not a teacher, um, I spend an enormous amount of time of either listening to other podcasts from all over the community. I mean, all of them basically, or creating my own content. Um, and yeah, and there's a lot of podcasts about, you know, about cults and, you know, you probably know which one it is about the one about why you shouldn't join this particular cult and people are trying to get out of it, you know, and mm -hmm. this, this is really what this reminds me of this whole notion of guys, you know, out there and, and in, in, in the blindness community too, in the disability community, we have a lot of people who are very, you know, 2020 has been a bad year for everyone. And especially in the blindness community, we have a lot of people who are not happy, depressed, you know, not really sure about themselves in life, but yeah, you gotta be really careful what to believe. Definitely don't believe these, these crazy ones, you know, but then of course, how, how can you tell if it's crazy? Well, unfortunately, this is the problem. You can't tell until it did you in. That seems yeah. that seems to be the issue. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and this year, this year in particular, has just been really off the wall with just so much conspiracy stuff uh, circulating about the pandemic um, yeah. and, and the election and the civil unrest and and everything. You know, uh, people are afraid and they're angry and they're they're cooped up inside on the internet, and it's really provided a really bad blend where uh, a lot of this conspiracy stuff has been uh, getting under people's skin. I just hope that, you know, next year, starting next week, people start to get better, you know, regardless of opinions of the vaccine, I hope that people get it, I guess. And I, ho I really hope that we start to get better and start to kind of come out of this hibernation that we've gotten ourselves into. But my concern is that so many people have gotten themselves so stuck, you know, I wonder, I, I am very concerned. I mean, this is, this is all, you know, as I said on this, on my show, um, I've recorded many 
very disturbing interviews. Um, I mean, your, your book is, you know, amazing. You know, you've done, you're doing an amazing job, but still, this is an incredibly disturbing interview. Um, mm. Very, very, un very unsettling. All of this is for, for, for sure. Um, so have you, have you gotten the sense that any other of any other superheroes are like, not necessarily following in Richard's footsteps, but are maybe uh, getting sucked into their own conspiracies or other conspiracies. Basically, have you done any work to maybe prevent this from happening again? That would be helpful. Um, I don't. I don't think that most of them uh, were were into conspiracy. Um, in fact, Richard had tried to sort of introduce himself to the larger real life superhero community at one point. And he tried to have me help him do that. So he wrote the statement uh, that he wanted me to share. And at the time, there was a popular real life superhero forum. So I posted that um, on their forum and their response to him overall was, was pretty negative. They were like, what is this guy talking about? Okay. So um, they probably knew, they could probably tell that I mean, obviously, it's not his fault. He clearly had some couple screws were loose. They, 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 yeah. they, they, they picked up on it. Well, yeah. that's that's both good and bad. Yeah. They, yeah. They, Eventually, there was a few of them that did make friends with him, uh, and I was I was really glad about that. Actually, I was like, maybe these guys can kind of team up with him, and he'll get like a sense of normalcy, you know. Um, so he did make some friends in, in California there. He had moved uh, to Nevada. So he would go visit them once in a while. And, you know, they would do like a, a supply handout to homeless people. Um, they did a comic book store appearance together one time. But he had a lot of trouble maintaining any sort of friendship. So he eventually kind of uh, burned his bridges with those guys and was leading this sort of lonely, isolated life. So I think a few of them tried to kind of extend a hand to him, but he just um, didn't want to. He got a little bit paranoid about them or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And as, and as you know, as, as a blind person, you know, I never had any, I've had many interests in life. None of them have been to be a superhero, but it is, you know, now that I'm hearing it from you, hearing it directly from the person who wrote it rather than, you know, the second hand from another podcast, kind of the hearsay perspective. Now I'm hearing it from you. The entire story is so much more relatable to me. It's so much more understandable. It is awfully complicated though. It is, it is a lot of moving parts of the puzzle for, for, for sure. Definitely. Yeah. Um, but you know, all of it, all of it is very, is very concerning, I guess. Um, yeah. And um, do you have, I'm just curious, do you have like the, the, the comic strip, um, that he wrote where he explains his whole do you physically have it I mean do you want to show it like maybe show some of the art just for the YouTube side just maybe show some of the art if you want you don't uh, have to, I'm just curious if it's sure. around there okay yeah uh, so here's uh, my book by the way American Madness um, and you can see the cover this is Richard in his costume and then there's a red square that's sort of an overlay and uh, that's a a picture of him not in his costume. Um, so he's on the cover there. And then uh, this is a copy of a comic book that he drew. Uh, so okay, so I, now, he, now he wrote that, in other words. He, he yes. Read, yeah. So that's he all wrote, his work. He wrote and illustrated it in prison, actually. Wow. Yeah. Um, so he kind of just goes through uh his raid on the bohemian grove and um there's a couple pages about his trial afterwards and um it's very interesting his artwork um, can you can you describe for the for the blind you know viewers mm -hmm. who cannot see it all can you describe maybe one of the most interesting or the most revealing or interesting picture to you that really shows the de the depth of this issue yeah yeah well be sure i i think the cover um actually so the cover says Phantom Patriot. Um, his artwork is, uh, it's really interesting. It's, it's good, I mean, it's not bad. It's a little bit weird. There's something weird about it. And it's hard to describe what I mean. Um, things are just kind of weirdly symmetrical and like the characters all have these sort of big bug eyes and they always look really angry. But the cover here is uh, Richard 
in his Phantom Patriot costume. He's um, walking into the Bohemian Grove. He's carrying a, a big semi-automatic rifle, which was one of the weapons that he had when he went in. And in the distance, you can see a statue that is in the Bohemian Grove. And this really exists. It's a 40 foot tall statue of an owl and it's called the Great Owl of Bohemia. And that's where conspiracy theorists said that they sacrifice these victims in this sort of satanic ritual in front of this owl. Right, and that's and that I guess is one of the things that set him off, like one of his many yeah. catalysts or triggers, I guess, yeah. Yeah, so he's sort of running or walking towards the statue of an owl and there's a speech balloon and he's saying, everybody knows that corruption thrives in secret places. President Woodrow Wilson. So that's a, a quote from Woodrow Wilson there. Um, and yeah, that's the illustration. Yeah, meaning that he's basically telling us in that that he he's that that's his cry for help, and that's his cry for I don't trust the government, I don't trust what's going on around me. He's he's saying help me in that whole book there. That yeah. is really that is really true. That's really tragic. Yeah, incredible art, and it's incredible tragedy. Jeez. Yeah. uh that's that is that is quite a um that is quite a story um and it's true um all of it's true ha have you reported on anything else like this or was this like your one and only uh your one and only story that you've ever done uh covering such an unusual character um i would say it's the most unusual uh book that i've done so far um, like I said, my first book, Heroes in the Night, was about real-life superheroes in general. I talked about uh, many different real-life superheroes in that book and my adventures with them. Um, I also wrote a book called Monster Hunters. That one was about paranormal investigators, uh, which was pretty interesting. And I wrote a book called Apocalypse Any Day Now, which is about what people generally call doomsday preppers. Hmm. So, But all of those books were kind of working up to this book which kind of combines some elements of all of those and is its own unique story and just bigger than anything that I've done before definitely um so do you have a podcast by the way um I do not I I'm a, a frequent guest on different podcasts but I don't have one of my own yet I'm thinking we'll about doing one. We'll, pl we'll, pl well, please get started because okay. you, you're extremely knowledgeable. You do a great job. Uh, your content's really good. Um, remember, I'm someone who's not interested in superheroes. And then when I started to piece all this together, I was like, wait a minute. This is way too weird or way too interesting. I have to <laughs> learn. I have to learn. I, you know, thank you as a teacher. I th you know, thank you for teaching me about this. I, I really do appreciate it. Um, and I hope that you know, listeners to my show and others will, will appreciate and will appreciate the importance of the issue at heart here, which is to have kindness for someone who needs help is what is what all of this is about. Help people for once, you know, and I think that's really the theme of this year. And it really goes full circle because we see so many in my community of blind people who need help. Guys, this is exactly the reason. This is exactly the disturbing reason why if someone needs to talk, just talk. If someone needs help, help them. And yeah. maybe, I don't know, maybe don't don't go near the Bohemian Grove. Maybe don't be a superhero. <laughs> maybe, you know, maybe there is some some careful criticism about that. Maybe, I mean, I'm not, you know, I mean, the other superheroes didn't do anything wrong. They're out protecting us on, on, this, on the streets, I suppose. But maybe people should be a little bit more careful in general about getting this far into anything, I guess, is the, uh, is, is the life lesson if there is any, right? Yeah, I, I think you're right, Aaron. And um, I think one thing that I really liked about this book was when you first hear about Richard's story in a quick glance, then you're like, oh, this guy is a completely kooky, crazy crackpot. And, you know, he must've been really dumb and, and wacky and all this stuff but you know when you start to talk to him and talk to other people in his life you're like oh this is a, a person you know he, he had a life he, he has friends and and I just feel bad I feel like he had these creative abilities in that if he could just found something 
that would have engaged him, maybe he wouldn't have slipped down this dark path. So like you say, I think, you know, just talking to each other and uh, trying to understand someone, even if their ideas are different than yours is, is all we can really do. Yeah, or start podcasts. You know, podcasting is about listening to what other people have to say and creating engaging content. So, no, I, I seriously, you should start a podcast about this. This is really important to educate people about this type of thing, about not fall in, in general, asking for help and not falling into these conspiracy theory traps. Now, it sounds like overall, it sounds like Richard, you know, probably, you know, had had some other challenges in his life health wise and you know, maybe he could have been saved. Maybe not. It's not for me to say. But yeah. if, if, if we can help one more or if we can prevent this from happening again, it would be good. If we can prevent problems in the future, that would be that would be really good. Um, I must say um, that was the that was the longest I've ever talked about superheroes. I've seen a couple of the Spider-Man movies in the theaters. So, yeah. Do you after going through all of this madness? After going through all of this American madness, do you do you, are, are you do you ever watch um, you know superhero movies? Um, will you go to a superhero movie in the theater, or does it still kind of leave a Ugh, that's unsettling taste in your mouth when you think about it? What do you think? <laughs> no, I, I still I enjoy superhero um, superhero uh, media in general. Um, I still do read some superhero comics. I see the movies pretty frequently when they come out. But it definitely has changed my perspective on on the whole thing a little bit because uh, I've met people who have tried to do it in real life. And um, I'll, I'll say it's it's not at all like you see in the movies. So or maybe that maybe those people should go seriously. Maybe those people should go to Hollywood if they really want to be a superhero. Maybe they should try out for an extra on one of those. <laughs> See, that would be an appropriate way of maybe harnessing that desire, and then they could be in a movie. I don't know, but yeah. then the problem is Hollywood's in California. That's where Bohemian Grove is. So <laughs> that would end up. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how good that idea is. Probably it's not good. But <laughs> but um, yeah, all all very all very fascinating and, and, incre and an incredible topic. Um, as I said, I I've heard everything on this show um, on Aaron's opinion. My podcast geared towards mostly disability issues, and now. And now I've heard everything on this thing. Now I've heard this. I now I have a superhero story. I, I haven't gotten that one yet. I don't think I don't think I'll get one uh, again. Um, <laughs> I mean that's basically all the questions I've had. You've been you've been a magnificent host, ma magnificent okay. guest here. Um, and know that you know once you're on my show, you're always welcome. So if you meet other superheroes who want to come on to Aaron's opinion, sure, they, I'll bring them they, on. they can, they can just, they can just email me Aaron's opinion six at gmail.com. Um, right. That would be very, that would be very interesting. Do you, do you have any questions for me? I always like to ask the guests at the end, if you can only ask me only one question to really make me sweat, what do you want to know? <laughs> I mean, uh, after everything you've been through, I would hope, I, I think you can come up with a really good question, you know, <laughs> Uh, well, uh, tell us about what your superhero persona would be. Sure. Um, I think it would be creating a podcast where I help people who are blind or have disabilities to, to have knowledge and to really enjoy the art of podcasting and coming and communicating about the issues that are most important to them. And that's, okay. a, that's a superpower that you can have wearing this shirt or any other or all seasons, East Coast, West Coast, whether I'm near the Bohemian Grove or not, whether I'm in France or not, my power can be podcasting. How about that? Oh, there, you, mission accomplished. You've already accomplished your mission. Well, see, I see. So then is it, well, then all, it's, that makes it all worthwhile. All right. If someone wants to get in touch with you um, personally, uh, well, well, you know what I mean. So yeah, if someone wants to reach out to you about this episode, how would they do that? If you want, you can give yourself a plug, of course. Okay, yeah. Um, I've got a website, tkrulos.com. That's T-E-A-K-R-U-L-O-S.com. And the website has my contact information and information about my books. Um, and I write a weekly column on it called Tease Weird Week. So. <laughs> Tease Weird Week. Or you could also have kind of um, kind of a play on words. You could have tea with tea. <laughs> right, right. That's good. That would be good. Tea with tea. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. But T's T's weekly. He's Maybe weird. that'll be my podcast name. Yeah. A cup yeah. of tea with a cup of tea for tea. A right. cup of tea for tea. That's good. That's good. Yeah. yeah, I like it. Any other words of wisdom for my audience? Oh, I just it's been a a rough long year and um it's almost over now, so uh, I'm I'm hoping everyone uh, things get better and we get back on track and good things happen in 2021. So I hope everyone's been doing all right out there during this crazy time. T, I completely agree with you. I wish you the best of health. I wish everybody else the best of health all over the world. Um, and of course, I have a very special way that I end every episode, which is saying thank you. We'll be back next time. And of course, as I say, help one person today, help a million people tomorrow.